If you would, turn with me this morning over to Ruth in chapter 1. Ruth chapter 1. We may be small in number this morning, but we are mighty in spirit. Amen? Ruth chapter 1, starting in verse 14 and going on to verse 21. Ruth chapter 1, verse 14, going to verse 21. Here's what we read. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Ophrah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. Forever I go, you, forever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. We're going to pause here for just a, a brief, a brief moment. Because I want to really focus on what's going on. This is a popular couple verses in the story of Ruth. Most of us know them quite well. But there's a lot to unpack here. When you get to the beginning of Ruth, when you start in verse 1 and you kind of read down to this point, you find that Ruth and her husband, or Naomi and her husband, excuse me, left Bethlehem to go over to the land of Moab. There was a drought during that time. There wasn't a lot of food. This is during the time of Judges. So they leave and they go to the land of Moab. While they're there... Their sons marry Moabite women. And over the course of time, Naomi's husband dies. Both of her sons die. And they find out that there's bread back in Bethlehem. So they decide to move and go back from where they came. But on the journey there, Naomi's older now. And she, there's not much hope that she's going to live a good life. So she turns to her daughter-in-laws and she tells them, Go back. Go back to Moab. Go back to Moab. Go back to your people. That's where you need to be. You'll have a good life there. They don't want to leave, but two of them leave. But, but one, or actually one leaves, excuse me, but the other one decides to stay, and that is Ruth. And that's where we get this, this verse, this response from Ruth to Naomi, because Naomi wants her to leave, and she won't leave. And in her response, she tells Naomi, your God will be my God. Now hold up a minute. Let's unpack that for a minute. What good has happened to Naomi in serving the Lord? She had to leave her home. She lost her husband. She lost her sons. She's now older. She's going back where she came, most likely to be a pauper, to not, to not have any prosperity in life. And yet, Naomi, Naomi, what she's told by Ruth is, your God will be my God. That tells me something had to have happened. She had to see such a faith in Naomi that it inspired her to say, I want what you have. Life's knocked you down. Life's not been good to you. You've suffered all these things. But I want what you have. Where you go, I'm going to go. Where you lodge, I'm going to lodge. Where you stay, I'm going to stay. I'm going to be right here beside you. I'm not going to leave. Now, is that not amazing that through all the adversity, through everything that Naomi encountered, Ruth refuses to leave her absolutely refuses and she goes with her that's an amazing thing that you could go through so much disappointment so much trial and yet somebody looking at you from the outside says i want what you have well what do i have i mean naomi you look at naomi what does she have she doesn't have a home she doesn't have a family she doesn't have money and naomi says i want what you have Ruth says, I want what you have. Man, that tells you something about the faith right there. See, that's where Hebrews really comes into play, where it says that our faith is the substance of things that we hope for, the evidence of things not seen. It changes something inside of here. We don't look the way the world looks. We don't act like the world acts. And then when they look at us, they should see something, not a physical possession, not all the trials we go through, but they see a strength inside of us that keeps pushing us forward, even though we may want to stop. And that's what Ruth saw in Naomi. And she said, I can't leave. I won't leave. And as a matter of fact, we go further in this story. We keep on reading in the verse 18. It says, and when she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. 
Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. And I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me. Then Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now this is exciting because they don't know it, but we know it because we know the story. Something exciting is getting ready to happen. You see where God is setting the stage for something good to happen. But buddy, if you were there, if you were there in that moment, you would see nothing but bad. And that was where Naomi was. Naomi's look at it, she goes, I went out full, I had a family, I come back and I have nobody. I have nothing. And here stands Ruth right beside her. Right beside her. And she's saying, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to leave. And here, notice the Bible specifically states a Moabitess. Why? Because they were an enemy of God's people. These were not just, just friendly neighbors. These were considered enemies of God's people. But Ruth walked away from that. Remember, she told Naomi, she said, your people are my people. Your God is my God. She's now adopted into that Jewish family because she says, I don't want to be a Moabitess anymore. I want to be one of your people. Isn't the first time it happened? The same thing happened when the Hebrews left Egypt. Remember, a lot of Egyptians converted and became Jews and they went with them. Same thing's happening here. She saw something inside church this is inspiring because what that says is that when naomi was walking with the lord it wasn't a walk of convenience it wasn't something where yeah everything's going good i'm going to serve the lord today yeah everything's going the way i need it to go i'm happy with god today serving god is serving him in both the good times and the bad times the times where nothing's going your way that's when you find out how good your faith really is is when everything, when it all falls apart, when it all just goes the bad way, you still stand up and say, I serve the Lord today. Today I serve the Lord. People watch you. Children watch you every day. Every single day people are watching you to see what you're going to do in a bad circumstance. And Satan knows. He knows what God has in store for you. God told us in His Word. He said, my plans are good. So Satan's objective, what is it? Make you stop. Make you stop. Make you get discouraged to make you feel like you're defeated and to make you stop in your tracks because when you stop, you miss out. You miss out. One of the greatest things Miranda and I try to teach our children is perseverance to say you don't give up. You don't give up. You keep going. You keep serving God. In the good and the bad, you serve Him. As a matter of fact, if you hold your place in Ruth, go on over to Psalms chapter 126. Go ahead and turn there with me. Psalms 126. This is powerful. You start getting in the Word of God and you see these things, you start seeing where God has got some amazing plans. Psalms 126, starting in verse 5. Listen to this. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes out, he who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Those who sow in tears. That's not a pleasant time in life. That's not everything going great and wonderful. That's something going, going wrong, isn't it? But it says if you continue sowing during that time, you continue serving God in that time, something good is going to happen. Something good is going to happen. I remember my dad's ministry. Dad's had several different ministries throughout the years. And I remember him and mom, one time they went to a church, they were serving the church, and nothing was going right. Everything was going wrong. And I remember they just fell on their knees in prayer. Not once, not twice, but daily, hourly, for weeks, for months, just falling on their knees in prayer, saying, God, what are we going to do? It was a tough time in my family at that point. 
Lori was doing better, but my grandfather was dying of cancer at that time. You had the, the church that wasn't going very well. It was the sole income of my family, so that was being affected in turn. Dad had a business that was failing. It was starting to go under. He was getting ready to file bankruptcy at that time and try to get back up on his feet. Everything you can imagine was going wrong for my family at that point. And where did they go? They went right to their knees. And they went continually, regularly, saying, God, what is going on? What is going on? You brought us here and now it's, it's not going well. God, you promised us good things, but we have family that's sick. God, you've, you brought us here and now we're facing financial ruin. God, what are you doing? What are you doing? I tell you what, church, if you've never been there, that's where your faith really gets tried. But you stay faithful and you keep digging. You keep digging in your faith and you keep holding on saying, God, you promise. God, you promise. God, something good is coming. Something good is on the way. And eventually when mom and dad got up from prayer and they realized that God is still God, even in the bad times, that's when the church started turning around. That's when the finances started turning around. That's when everything started turning around and started coming back to glorify God. And yeah, my papa, he did pass away, but we glorify God because we recognize the legacy he left behind during that time. God took what the devil meant for our destruction and he turned it for his glory. What's going to happen in this story of Ruth? You're going to see where Satan did some things to lead to destruction, but God took it and he turned it for his glory. You see here where God brought Ruth and Naomi together and they became almost as one in, in many respects. And Naomi heard from Ruth at that time when she had no one else to lean on, when there was no one else to turn to. Ruth said, you can lean on me because I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying right beside you. I'm leaving my people. I'm leaving my history. And I'm joining up with you. Where you go, I go. Where you stay, I stay. I'm going to be your best buddy. I'm not going to leave your side. I'm going to go with you. And then you read here, and what does it say? It says, keep going. Because if you sow in tears, if you serve God in the bad times, you will indeed reap a great harvest. When we continue on in the story of Ruth and Naomi, we find where Naomi... Naomi starts kind of doing what, what ladies do. She starts kind of kind of setting up Ruth and Boaz a little bit. Boaz, he, we know him as the kinsman redeemer in Scripture. And here's what Boaz does. He looks at Ruth and he goes, whoa, what a woman. What a woman. And he wants to know exactly who Ruth is. He wants to get to know her better. So Naomi, she tells Ruth, here's what you do. Here's how you're going to get him. And she starts telling her what she needs to do. Ruth and Boaz get married. And in the course of getting married, they have a child. Now, let me read to you about this child real quick. Real quick. In Ruth chapter 4, Ruth chapter 4, starting in verse 13, listen to this. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And when he went into her, the Lord the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the woman said, Naomi, said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a close relative, and may his name be famous in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life, a nourisher of your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom, and she became a nurse to him. Also the neighbor women gave him a name, saying, This is the son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. What a name. Obed. He is the father of Jesse, he, who is the father of David. Now listen to this for just a moment. If Naomi had given up, if she just said, it's done, it's over and stayed in Moab, we would never have David. We would have never had David. Never have been born. If Naomi had not given a godly example and won the heart of her daughter-in-law, Ruth, Ruth would have never joined up with Naomi, and David again never would have been born. If Naomi had not been faithful to God, 
and followed him and come back to Bethlehem, never would have happened. So many things happened to bring about this child, Obed, the, grand, the father of Jesse, who became the father of David. So many things happened, but it was in tears. Every step of it was in tears. Every single moment, it was painful. Why was it painful? Because church, I'm telling you, David is, or not David, but Satan is afraid of you. He's afraid of what God can do through you and with you. And he tries to stop you every single step of the way. Stop you with discouragement. Stop you with oppression. Stop you with depression. To stop you and say, don't go any farther. Just stop where you are. But God makes you a promise in Psalms 126. He makes you a promise. If you will keep sowing in your faith, if you will keep putting it out there, even in tears, even in depression, even when you don't feel like it, even when you feel defeated, you will come out reaping a great harvest. What happened with Ruth? What happened with Naomi? They were faithful to God in desperation they were faithful to God and God brought the greatest king that Israel ever known God brought about the king who defeated Goliath who chased the enemy of God's people far away he brought about a king that was in the lineage of Christ himself and notice how God did it he brought a woman a Moabite who was an enemy of God's people and through the example of Naomi, she left her people. And she adopted the Jewish people. And as a result, God used her to bring about David. Man, what an amazing testimony that is. What an example it is for you and me. Because I'm telling you what, I'm lazy. If I can serve God and everything be hunky-dory, I would do it in a heartbeat. I would do it in a heartbeat. I'd say, wonderful, Lord, this is awesome. And I'd be whistling Dixie all the way to the pearly gates. This would be awesome. But God said, that's not how it works. That's not how I work. God says, you're going to have to serve me when you don't feel like serving me. You're going to have to learn to praise me when you don't feel like praising me. And in that, you're going to see a victory. In that, you're going to see a victory. One of the biggest mistakes Christians make is we constantly want to praise God when we feel good. We want to clap and we want to sing and we want to praise and we want to talk about how great God is. But we have a bad habit that when something horrible happens, we want to lash out at God and say, God, it's your fault. Instead of stopping for a minute and thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. God's plans for me are still good. God still loves me. He will use this. Don't know how He'll use it. But He'll use it. See, we're not supposed to have the answers in our moment or in our hour of desperation. We're not supposed to have the answers. We're supposed to walk by faith. Remember, faith is a thing that we hope for. It's something that we cannot see. You can't look at your trial and say, oh, I see how this is going to end. No, you're not supposed to. You're supposed to just take one step at a time and say with each step, I trust the Lord. I trust the Lord. I trust the Lord. Until in the end, you see something good. Remember, Ruth and Naomi, they most likely never met David. They never knew David's accomplishments or what he did. We do. They did not. They look at, they see a baby, Obed. And for them, that was enough. For them, that was enough. God is faithful. He brought us Obed. He's faithful. God is faithful. But God says, I'm not done. I'm not done. And then he brings about Jesse, and then he brings about David. By the time David comes, Ruth and Naomi are already up in heaven with the Lord. They're just looking at God and they're praising God saying, God, now we see, God, you're faithful. You are faithful. But they didn't see it here. But they believed it here. But they believed it here. Have you ever thought for a moment, have you ever looked around the sanctuary and wondered, I wonder what God's going to do in that family's lineage? 
or that family's lineage, or in that family's lineage. I wonder what it is that I will never see. I wonder who's going to come through their family line that I will never see or I will never meet. The amazing thing that God is going to do just because we stayed faithful to God. I wonder what He's going to do. Because I'm telling you, church, God does amazing things. Amazing, amazing things that you and I could never dream of. But it starts with us being faithful, being a Ruth, to be a Naomi, and just to say, yeah, I'm hurting right now, but I still serve God because I believe His plans are amazing and I believe something amazing is going to happen in the end. When you go further and you start reading about, the, about David and his family, this is the amazing thing about David. You look in 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 16. Go ahead and turn there with me. 1 Samuel chapter 16. This is incredible when you start looking at it. 1 Samuel chapter 16, starting in verse 1. 1 Samuel 16, starting in verse 1. It says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. Go to verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance. But I, the Lord, look at the heart. Look at that. I look at the heart. I examine the heart. Here's Saul's mourning because Saul has been rejected as king. He's going out to anoint another king who is David. And Samuel, when he's looking, he sees all these big old strapping guys. They look good. And he's like, oh yeah, there's a king in here. There's a king, but God says, no, 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 no. I look at the heart. And the heart, when you look at that heart, and you you read that passage, start looking at Ruth and Naomi. Start looking at Ruth and Naomi. Because when you look at them, you see where there was nothing good to look at on the outside. You had to be looking inside. You had to be looking in here. You had to look at Ruth's heart when she's speaking to Naomi. Man, there was love there. There was devotion there. There was dedication there. you got to look at Naomi. How did she live before that won the heart of Ruth in such a way? Man, she must have been walking and talking with the Lord that it really impressed Ruth. And now you look at David. And God says, listen, I'm not looking to use just anybody. I'm looking to use somebody that has a heart after me. They can be ruddy and good looking like David. They could be really tall and muscular like someone else. They could be beautiful, they could be ugly, it doesn't matter. God says, I look at the heart. They may have a story. They may have gone through all kinds of horrible stuff. I'm not looking at that. I'm looking to see the condition of their heart. What's going on on the inside. And look at David's lineage. Look at his lineage. You've got Naomi. All these horrible things happen. But in her heart, she still loved the Lord. God saw that. You look at Ruth. Right there, she lost her husband. She lost a lot following Naomi, but she had a heart to still serve the Lord and to do the right thing. You look at Obed. You look at Jesse. You look at David. What's the common denominator? The heart. The heart is the common denominator in all these things. These are people from all different walks of life. All of them had horrible things happen to them. And all of them decided to love God in the absolute worst of circumstances. They all decided to love God in the absolute worst of circumstances. Church, I've learned over the years, and I'm still learning it even now, but I've learned it really doesn't matter how big a church is, doesn't matter how small a church is, doesn't matter how excited it gets, doesn't matter how subdued they get. What matters is what is the heart of the church. What is the heart of the church? Because when I read these scriptures here, a couple things I know immediately. We're going to go through some hard times in life. We're going to suffer things that are absolutely awful and horrible. But where's your heart at in those moments? Do you love God anyway? Do you choose to serve God anyway? 
when we're not very lovely towards each other, when we're not very loving to each other, do you choose to love each other anyway? These are things that define a church body. And they define it in a very good way. Because God says, I look at your heart. I look at what's inside of here. My wife and I, oh my God, I love my wife so much. She is an amazing woman. There are times we fight with each other. Can you believe that? We shouldn't fight with each other. We fight with each other. And you know what's amazing? You get mad and you say things. Is that not true? You get mad, you spout off, you get frustrated, you get upset. And then you come back to each other and you realize there's a moment of clarity. You look at your beautiful bride in the eyes and you realize, I love her. You look at your handsome groom and you decide, I love him. And love defeats the anger. It defeats the frustration. It defeats everything that's gotten, gotten all riled up. It defeats it all. And you come back because you love each other. God says, when you have a heart for me, that's what your walk with God looks like. You may get mad, you may get frustrated, you may be hurt. But in the end, when you look in the eyes of God, you find out you love Him. You love Him. And you come back. And God comes running back to you. Our love for God conquers everything. And His love for us. Church today, have a heart like Ruth and Naomi. God doesn't promise you won't go through hard times. But He promises that He'll take those hard times and he'll, He will give you a victory where there is no victory. He'll make a way where there is no way. You have no idea what God is planning in the future of your life and in your family's lineage. God's going to do something incredible. But until then, learn to trust Him and just follow. Music can start making your way forward this morning. I have seen so many things in my life. I've seen hurt. Oh, I've seen hurt that for me would cripple me. It would absolutely cripple me. But you know God makes me a promise. And He makes the same promise to each and every one of you. God says, I will not put more on you than you are able to bear. And you say, Pastor, what exactly does that mean? Because I feel like he's put a great deal on me. It means that the burden you carry, it's not going to crush your faith. It won't. God's given you enough faith that it can hold through what you're going through. I can't imagine doing what Ruth and Naomi did. I, I cannot imagine. Can you imagine being Naomi and going to a foreign country because there's no food? Uh, people do it every day. They do it all the time. But for me, I can't imagine doing that. But she does, and she builds a life there. Her children are there, her husband's there. She builds a life. And she's there, and that, that, that foreign country now feels like home. You've got friends, you've got people there you know. It's home. And then all of a sudden, she has to leave again. She has to start completely over. And she's an old woman. She's got to start completely over. And she tells her daughter-in-laws, go home. Go back to your families. There's no reason you should be with me. My life's over. It's not going to go well for me. Just, just go back home. And one of them does go home. But there's one that won't leave. God gives you people in your life that won't leave. The Bible describes them as a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Ruth stayed. And here she becomes Naomi because now she's leaving her home country. And she's going to a foreign land. But she says, I'm going to make it my home. I'm going to make your God my God. Where you go, I'm going to go. Where you stay, I'm going to stay. And God's going to take care of us. Your God, Naomi, is going to take care of us. That was Ruth's response. And then comes a baby. This is why we celebrate babies. Because that baby in and of itself wasn't a tremendous promise, but it was a sign of a promise. And then you have from that lineage, David. But again, I can't stress it enough, they never saw the end result. They never saw David. They never saw 
what God was doing in its entirety. But God was up to something. Because through that lineage came Jesus Christ into the world to be mine and your sacrifice for our sins. Think about that for a moment. Because Naomi sowed in tears. Because Ruth took a step of faith and decided to make Naomi's God her God. The lineage of the Savior of the world was born. We could not get to this manger without their story. This manger would not have happened without Ruth and Naomi's story. The promise given in Psalms 126 I think about this and I think about it to Ruth and Naomi because this this is their family that wrote it. You sow in tears. If that doesn't preach. You sow in tears. And you will come back with a great harvest rejoicing all the way. They sowed in tears saying we believe. We trust. We hope. And into the world, thousands of years later, comes this baby, the Son of God, into the world to be the forgiveness of my sins and your sins. Who would have ever thought that? A woman who goes to a foreign country, who loses everything, her husband, her children, everything. And she chooses to still believe you think that's a personal victory. No, it was a global victory. Because through her, the Savior was born. The Savior was born. Through her, Jesus came. And then you and I sit back and we say, what about my story? What about my pain? What about what I'm going through? What's God going to do there? Naomi said the same thing. And God said, look what I can do. Naomi said, I'm bitter. Call me Mara. I'm bitter. And God said, Naomi, you're only bitter because you can't see what it is I'm about to do through you. What I'm about to do through you. Naomi, believe. God is telling you and I today, believe. Believe. God's going to do something good. I know this because His Word tells that to me. His Word says that. God's going to do something amazing through your family, through your life. God's going to do something amazing. Maybe you will see it. Maybe you will not. But you must stay faithful. In the hard times, in the easy times, stay faithful. And watch what God does. If you've got a prayer you need to lift up to the Lord this morning, if there's something that God has laid on your heart, maybe you're someone you say, I just want to give my life back to Christ. I want to rededicate my life. I want to start over. God, wipe this slate clean and start my story over. Then this is a time for you to come forward and do that right now. Maybe you're someone you're just saying, Pastor, I just need some prayer. I need some encouragement today. I'm going through a hard time. I'm going through that Naomi period of my life. And I've got to learn to praise God when it hurts. And I want to do that this morning. Then you come to an altar and you praise God anyway. And you fall on your face before Him. Maybe you're someone today, you're just saying, Pastor, I've never made that decision. I never made that decision to follow Jesus Christ. And I want to make that decision today. This is your time. Whatever prayer you need to pray for anything God has laid on your heart, for anything that you need to pray about, this altar is open. I invite you this morning. Please come.